Welcome to Changing Higher Ed, a podcast dedicated to helping higher education leaders improve their institutions. With your host, Dr. Drum McNaughton, CEO of The Change Leader, a consultancy that helps higher ed leaders holistically transform their institutions. Learn more at changinghighered.com. And now, here's your host, Drum McNaughton. Thank you, David. Our guest today is Jerry Zarnecki, Chairman and CEO of the National Leadership Institute and Principal Stockholder of the Deltenium Group. I've known Jerry through my membership at NACD, where we are both fellows, and Jerry teaches board strategy, risk management, audit committee operations, and cybersecurity to many institutions through NACD. Jerry recently stepped down from serving as the chair of the Board of Trustees for the National University System, and he joins us today to talk about the role of higher ed boards and how it's changing and how it needs to transform both its business model and its governance structures. Jerry, great to see you. Welcome back. Well, hi, Drum. How are you? Doing very well. Yourself? I'm great, thanks. Busy, busy, but that's what I like. This is good. Well, you know, you're not as busy as you used to be with National University System. You stepped down since the last time we had you on the podcast as its chair. First, congratulations. You did some fabulous jobs while you were there. Well, I I spent 28 years on that board, so I guess I I guess I had to have spent done something right during that period of time. So, but yes, it was a, it was a great passion of mine. Well, maybe maybe you did some really good things, which I know you did, but maybe the bylaws need to be changed a little bit for term limits. I don't know. You tell me. <laughs> well, I happen to be, I happen to believe that term limits are a bad idea. I think that people should stay on a board for as long as they're making a contribution and as long as they're capable of being effective. If they are not effective, they should be told, say goodbye. Well, unfortunately, most boards don't have the courage to do that. So term limits are the option or age limits are the option. I, I get that. I've, I've been in that situation having to ask people to step down and uh, it isn't the most pleasant, but that's, you know, that's why you wear the, the big, big boy pants. You, you've got to make right. those hard decisions as a board chair. Well, we do it in business. When we run, when we run a business, we tell people that they're not cutting it. So why can't we do it on a board? I'll tell you why. Because most of them are friends of ours. They're not just colleagues. They're friends of ours. And it's hard to do that to a friend. That's what it's all about. You mean there isn't enough board independence? Is that what you're saying? I didn't know. I didn't say that. I just simply said <laughs> that it's hard to fire a friend. <laughs> yes. I remember one institution that I worked with, the, the president of the university had recruited all 24 board members. And I was like, there is no way there was independence there. No, of course not. Yeah. yeah. And so, so we're going to talk today about the changing roles of boards. And we've seen a lot of interesting things pre-COVID versus po- post-COVID. And some things are starting to emerge. First, what, what are you seeing as the big pain points for boards nowadays pre-COVID that are starting to materialize or are actually in place now? Well, I think first, is enrollment trends, they're down. And we don't know exactly why, but there are some demographic factors that are driving that. Just the nature of that age cohort that would be starting freshmen right now. So I think that's one thing. Two is that because of the society that we've got today, there are people who are questioning the value of the degree more than they did 10, 15 years ago. Now, whether it's logical, whether it's demonstrably correct or not is is irrelevant. There is a perception that maybe the degree isn't worth as much of all my time and energy and those four years that I got to spend doing it as uh, people thought to tell me earlier. The third thing I think is that there is a movement afoot in our society that we call the technology revolution, like it or not. The digital world, the internet, this whole phenomenon of the next stage of technology that happened since the time that we caused a bit and byte computer to be created, that technology has morphed into not just an enabling function, 
it's morphed into the core business for many people. So that we are now have businesses that are baked and the whole entirety of the business is in fact driven by and incorporates technology services. And so as a practical matter, technology is dominating. If all you have to do is look at the stock market, where's all the growth been in the stock market? It's been in technology firms. It's not the old line companies that have grown the values in the marketplace. The marketplace has valued technology companies enormously, maybe too much, but it has put an enormous value on technology. That means that a lot of people are working for technology companies. And a lot of the people who are working for those technology for companies fall into two categories. One is they do the grunt work. They stack stuff on shelves and they sweep floors, et cetera. They maybe do some clerical activities in the traditional clerical sense. And then there's the whole rest of the process where all the money is for compensation. And it's on the technology side. It's on the side where skills are required, not know so much as intellect, not so much understanding of the world around, but skills, skills that I can pay for, that I as a, as a company can decide that I want to hire. And that skill revolution, I, I call it a skill revolution, as opposed to a comprehensive educational revolution, is a huge change from where we were 10 years ago or more. Yeah. Have boards adapted, higher ed boards, have they adapted to these changes or are they adapting? Well, I, I think there probably are some. I mean, I don't ever want to say no, not, none. But I think that part of the problem is, is that I don't think that the administrations have adapted either. Um, I think that, that the traditional institutions are still trying to be what they were before this revolution started. There are a few that get it. I happen to know that there are a few that are saying, we're going to make a really important commitment to the skills development process, and they're doing it. So there's no doubt about that. But the vast majority of higher educational institutions out there, neither the board nor necessarily the administration has come to grips with the fact that maybe, just maybe, there is an alternative course of learning that needs to be acknowledged by the institution, something more than just a, quote, liberal education. And let me start by saying, I'm a huge fan of liberal education. I'm the product of it. And, and I believe that it made a difference in my life and in who I am and how I behave. But there's a huge set of the population out there that can make just as much money or more than a liberal education enables them by simply learning how to do coding. And so we can't ignore the fact that the, the, that the ability to earn a living wage is hugely impacted by technical skills. So that's impacting, I think, potential student attitudes towards what do they want to what do they want to do today to enable them to get the job that will give them the compensation that gives them the lifestyle they're looking for. Mm -hmm. So I think those are three very important things. And I think boards have to get to the point where they start asking the question, how important is this in the marketplace? How important is this tech skill uh, revolution that we're seeing in the marketplace. If it's important enough, then how are we going to respond to it? What are the questions we need to be asking about our position in the market? Unfortunately, too many boards of trustees of institutions are convinced, maybe by administration, maybe by their own inclination, that they're not really in a business. This is an academic learning environment, and it's not really a business. Well, I happen to believe that any enterprise that generates revenue from somebody who pays you to do something, and then you have expenses to be able to deliver that something, you're a business. You may not pay taxes if you're a not-for-profit, but you're a business. Mm -hmm. And so with that, boards have got to shift around their perceptions to be able to ask these type of questions. I mean, when you take a look at a Michael Crow at Arizona State, he is making these shifts and, you know, one can argue it was Board driving this or him. I suspect it was more him. But he's bringing up these type of things for lifelong learning, meeting the student where the student is, and 
he's convinced his board that this is the way to go. You know, if you want to go for a degree there, absolutely. They've got certificate programs. They've got micro credentials. They've got all these kind of things this just in time learning that students for their entire life need. Isn't this something the board should be exploring? It is. And I would love to think that the boards in academic institutions, institutions of higher learning, would actually think that way. But you just made a statement that I think is really important to latch on to. First of all, I would suspect that his board did not drive him to do what he's doing. That I know him well enough to know that he is a strong-willed person and that his board is more influenced by him than he is by them. Michael Crow, strong-willed? I... Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so in my mind, there is no doubt about it that in his case, he believes he sees the light and he's got the support of his board. There are a very significant number of other institutional leaders who don't see that same light. They are, in fact, unfortunately caught in yesterday's paradigm. And because they are, they are, as a matter of fact, partially because they're a product of that paradigm, <clears throat> they, have hard, they have a hard time letting go. Now, Michael's unusual. He is a product of that paradigm. In fact, he was a provost before he became a president. So he was right there in the middle of the old paradigm. But as a practical matter, he is seeing something that many of them don't see. Or if they see it, they don't know how they could possibly move their institution in that direction. So even when a president of an institution sees what is happening and thinks that they understand what the change needs to be, there is, it is a very difficult journey, very difficult journey to transform an institution from the historical paradigm to something that's different. Just yesterday, I'm probably dating this session, but just yesterday, there was an announcement that I, I saw a release on the fact that the faculty, I think it was the faculty, I don't even know, I think it was the faculty senate at the University of Texas has announced their absolute independence of the administration and the trustees. It was a stunning story. I, 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 you, you, all of you who listen to this need to go check me out. But it was a stunning story that I read that basically said that they have said, nobody has a right to tell us what we're going to teach. Nobody has a right to tell us what we're going to teach. Not the trustees, not the administration, nobody. And it was, it was turned all around about, by the way, it's, it's a function of, uh, I think, just to be political about it, there is a lieutenant governor in the state of Texas who is trying to lobby to get rid of tenure. And so they are sitting there saying, oh, no, that's my precious protection. So I'm going to make it clear to them they can't make the mistake of thinking that I'm going to stand by and have you tell me that I'm not going to have tenure. So I'm going to announce my independence of all of you. You can't control me. And that attitude, that attitude is an extreme statement about what you see on almost every quality educational campus. The faculty and the administration frequently don't want to talk about it, frequently don't want to even address the potential tension that exists there. But there is a, it is very difficult for an institution to change what it does and how it does it without having faculty buy-in. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and it's not just without having it because they've got tenure and they can say, we're not going to pay any attention to you. But even if they, they aren't being that, quote, hard, hard over, you still have to get them to do it the new way. You still have to get them to think the new way. And that is a, that's a sales job that many boards of trustees and many administrations don't know how to pull off. No. So transformation is a tough challenge. So even if a president of an institution sees that he needs to change or she needs to change where the future is, then that process of how do you attack it is hugely difficult. And most of them, quite frankly, don't know where to start. And you bring up an interesting point because of that. And I hadn't heard this about the, the UT faculty. Frankly, it, it doesn't surprise me given 
you know, the political stances that a lot of states are starting to take with higher education. But you've got accreditors who are saying that faculty control curriculum, that there is, you know, shared governance. Great. You know, I've, I've talked to a number of folks recently about making sure people understand the racing model, responsible, accountable, consult, inform. This is the way faculty governance should be worked. If a president wants to stop the board from doing something, all he or she has to do is say, well, there's shared governance. We have to stop this because this is in the faculty's purview. Right. And it's, it's kind of the third rail that nobody wants to talk about, but everybody says, you know, it, it's not so much t- about tenure, I think, as it is really about academic freedom and being able to teach. The irony is, is that the conflating of tenure and academic freedom and programs and curricula are two, are, are there different? Two separate issues. They're all four of them are separate issues, all right? And, and if when you conflate them, you end up in an intractable situation. But if I say to you, and, and take tenure and put it off the side for a moment, if I say to you that we're not going to teach that course because there's no demand for it, and the faculty member looks at him and says, you can't get rid of that course because it's what I believe in and it's critical that I teach it. That is a conflict between the service provider and the institution. The academic freedom would say, you can study that all you want, but we're not going to teach that course. All right. It comes back to running it like a business versus a hobby. Well, and, or, and it goes further than that. It goes to, you can want to teach that course from town until hell freezes over, but if no students want to go into the classroom, I'm not, going to, I'm not going to offer that course because they have to pay for you, all right? I need you to teach courses they want to take, and I need you to teach courses that help further the development of them towards a core competency in whether it's a liberal education or a core competency in a technical discipline. And what you want to teach may not have any relevance to my, what, what we have decided as an institution are the outcomes that are rest necessary for our students. The, this conflict, is, uh, you're absolutely right. When they conflate all these issues together, what degree program should we have? What courses are going to be required in those degree programs? They have to be structured in a way so that it enables the student to be, in, to be empowered with knowledge, skills, and attitudes that will take them into the rest of their lives. And a faculty member doesn't necessarily know what that is. A faculty member, a faculty member is, should be a subject matter expert, and I want them to be able to pursue in every way possible the pursuit of knowledge. That's wonderful. Academic freedom is the freedom to pursue knowledge. I get that. But it's not the freedom to be able to tell me that I'm going to lose money every time you teach a course. Yeah, it's like like a a good friend of mine at Cal State San Marcos. He was completely frustrated. He was the dean, completely frustrated because the faculty wanted to say on where they were going to put the next parking lot. I mean, seriously, folks, this is not (laughs) your role. But having said that, we've got I think we have to get boards more involved with the institution. I know some people would say, oh, the boards can't micromanage. I don't think that they're doing enough management, let alone micromanagement. They need to really be digging down and asking the tough questions. You know, for example, before we came on air today, we were talking about online education. Most institutions who didn't have an online program already swapped over to Zoom. That did not work. So how is the board questioning what's going on with the delivery of its main product, which is educating students? Well, I think that the key, the, the, the key to being able to deal with that is, is that at a minimum, somebody, leadership or a consultant or somebody has got to get to the board to say, you need to ask one question. Start with this one question. We've been through two years of a living hell with COVID. What did we learn? What did we learn from this? Because there probably are a lot of lessons we've learned, some of which we may not want to hear, some of which 
we may not have any answers to if they pose the challenge for us. But if you don't learn from your troubling times, if you don't learn from when you've been through tr trials and tribulations, then there's no way for you to avoid them the next time, or there's no way for you to improve. And so the board needs to be convinced to ask that one question. We've been through two years worth of the COVID crisis. We've been shut down. We've had students who haven't been at campus, some, ca some cases for a year. We've had students who have experienced a totally different social climate. They've experienced a totally different lifestyle. They haven't even been able to see each other's mouths and noses. And, and so what did we learn from all of that? What did we as an institution learn from all of that? What were the pain points of that experience for our students? What were the pain points for our faculty? What did it do to us as an institution in terms of what we produced as a student set of outcomes? So that question needs to be asked in every institution. And there are going to be a lot of institutions that they actually ask that question. They're not going to like their answers mm -mm. because this was a tough time for academics, a tough time for students. And it was a tough time for faculties. And it's been an incredibly tough time for administrations and, and boards. Some of these boards didn't meet face-to-face -face for two years. Can, can we just throw the last two years out the window and start again? I don't think so. <laughs> it's like, like, you know, our mutual friend, Gordon Gee, COVID is changing higher ed in ways that it's needed, accelerating that by a decade or more. I mean, well, he's right about that. I completely agree with Gordon on that. That is, that gets to the issue about how you pull off this change. Yeah, he's right. There have been a number of institutions that have made changes to their to their way of life, if you will. They've made changes to their institutions because they were on the brink of financial ruin. Some of the others have deep pockets enough so that they've been able to sustain without having to go through change. But all of them, in my opinion, have to look at this experience and say, what did we learn from it? And by the way, there may be some good things we learned from it. All right. Mm -hmm. And if there are, then how do we capitalize on those good things? So I, I think it's it's a critical question. It's it's in the old military terms. And you're an old military guy. It's an after action report. You need to understand what happened when you were in the firefight. You need to understand why you why you won or why you got your butt kicked. And so in my mind, it is really critical for institutions and for boards, because if the president of the institution is not asking these questions themselves, they need to, they need to have that question asked of them. And if they're really on top of it, they should be asking it and they should be searching for ideas. And if they are, then the board ought to know about what those ideas are. Because some of the change that's necessary could be a major strategic shift for some institutions. And, and if it takes a major strategic shift, major strategic shifts are not easy. They're hard anywhere. In academia, I think they could be about as hard as they are anywhere else, except maybe in government. Well, strategic shifts in government are not easy because you've got an establishment that likes yesterday. Absolutely. <laughs> now, and, and higher ed, of course, I, I, I won't I won't take any offense to you calling me old just a little while ago. <laughs> I didn't realize I did. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, board, boards, you know, one of the things that that's troubles me about boards nowadays is they're not as engaged as, you know, higher ed boards are not as engaged as they could be. Some of them are very much engaged and are doing a really good job, but other boards, they're not as engaged. You and I have talked about having paid board members, you know, usually prohibited by nonprofits. Creditors don't allow any kind of paying. I don't know if we need to change this or not, but it's just one of those interesting points to me that's like, how do we get more and I wouldn't say more engaged board members, but really better trained board members rather than the same thing that, that we've had for so many years. Well, you know, as you know, in some cases, there are institutional barriers to having the opportunity to decide who's going to be on the board in the first place. Mm -hmm. 
and many of the public boards don't have any control over that whatsoever. And so it is, it, 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 there, those institutional barriers may make it almost impossible to be able to get a filtering mechanism that assures that, that you get the kinds of people that you're talking about. Some boards get lucky and get a few people. It really only takes a few people who are strong enough personalities and committed enough to be able to bring about some of the change, to be able to support. And, and there, are, there are two ways that change can happen, probably three, but I'm going to ignore the third one for the moment. The change can happen from board pushing for change by asking the right kinds of questions, challenging the administration and saying, look, all of the metrics you're showing me, give me pause for concern about where we are and where we're going. All of the things that we think and we hear you from you suggest that the old model may need to be modified. So some change can become from pressure from the top down, strong inquiry, the asking the right questions that causes administration to have to face the music on issues that need to be dealt with. Second level is when it comes from the administration up, where you have a strong leader. We talked about Michael Crow earlier as an example. I think that Michael Crow is a guy who has a lot of strong feelings about what it takes to be a successful university in the long run. And as a practical matter, a pressure on that institution is probably coming from him to the board and down to his team. All right. That's the second way. The third way is for it to actually happen at the very bottom of the organization, push up and the likelihood of that happening in an academic institution, if you consider the faculty being the boots on the ground that drive the business, the opportunity for that is probably pretty low because yeah. the faculty is happily living in the world that they've chose to live in. So they're not likely to be change agents, not very many change agents in faculty. There are exceptions, mm -hmm. but there are not going to be that many change agents in faculty. So the change is going to have to either come from the top at the board of trustees level or it's going to have to come from an enlightened CEO who drives it both ways, convinces the board that he's got, he or she's got the path to the future and works to enable the rest of the organization to see the light as well. So I, I believe that that's, look, I'm stuck on this word. Leadership matters. Leadership matters, whether it's board leadership or whether it's administrative organizational leadership. Leadership matters, and it takes leaders to make things happen. It may be old-fashioned, but frequently it takes a strong leader to make a difference. And a strong leader is not just somebody who's a bloody autocrat and orders people to do things, but it's somebody who, has a, who seeks a vision, fixates on a vision, works through the way that it takes to be able to get that vision to become a reality rather than just a dream, and then it takes hard work to execute it. And the hard work to execute it, almost all of that hard work is the business of being able to put yourself in a position where the people who work for you are the ones who execute it, which means they have to be empowered, enabled, and inspired to be able to do that. In other words, it takes great leadership yep. to do these things. Yep. One of the things that I tell, tell folks, especially trying to do board retreats or something like that, Change is inevitable. Growth is optional. Where do you want to stand? And getting the boards informed enough at a board retreat, at board meetings, so that they can understand what the external environment is. Because normally, organizations go to entropy. They go to die unless you inject other energy into it whether it be from the external environment or whether it be from your leadership. And so you've got to have those things in place. I would add another way to say what you said, not to argue with the, the quality of your comment, is change is inevitable. Success is the only thing that's optional. You can, you can face change and die with it, or you can face change, capture it, and succeed with it. But too many people, too many organizations have had the change in front of them. They've seen the vision, but they couldn't move fast enough. There's just examples, tons of examples everywhere where organizations may have seen the light, but they didn't execute on it. It's all about execution. 
yeah. all about that. So unfortunately, we're as we always do, we're coming up to the end of the end of the call. So three takeaways for university presidents and boards. One, the point that you've made all along, which is boards have to be engaged and they need a leader. They need to make sure that the leader of the board is an engaged person, not just somebody who has the title or has the age, the longevity, or the, the relative position in the community, just because they're visible, they need to be a leader. They need to lead the board. And by the way, you need leadership at the administrative level. Two, you need to be able to be thoughtful about the future. You need to recognize that the future is not gonna be the same as the past. It's just inevitable, as you just, you also pointed out, change is inevitable. So you need to recognize the change is coming and you need to figure out how you're going to jump on the change machine and survive and then succeed or thrive on top of that change process. So there's got to be a recognition that we're going to face change. How do we capture the, the key elements of success to be able to go for that? And then the third thing is you need to make sure you've got a team in place that can actually execute it because it doesn't do any good to have a vision, whether you're aligned between the board and executive management of the organization or not, if you don't have the people who can execute it, if you don't have their souls committed to this, if you don't have their minds and bodies working day in and day out to execute the change, then the vision will become a dream unfulfilled, not a dream that became a reality. Those are great takeaways, thank you. So what's next for you now that you've got all this extra time having stepped down from the National University System Board? Well, I'm, the bottom line is, is that I'm much more heavily involved in investments, some of them around education, I might add, but uh, I'm much more involved in investments and board membership. I'm also running, own a couple of companies that I run. Uh, so it's not like I'm not busy. National University gave me the opportunity to be able to leave behind that time and use it somewhere else. <laughs> well, that's very good. And, and I know you did so much for that university on behalf of all its you know, staff, faculty, students. Thank you for what you did. Well, thanks. It's nice of you to say that. Appreciate it. Thank you again, my friend. We'll do this again soon. You bet. Take care. You too. Thanks for listening this week, and a special thank you to this week's special guest, Jerry Zarnacki, former board chair at the National University System, and for his sharing his thoughts on how the roles of directors in higher ed are changing, and what universities need to do to transform and be sustainable going forward. Our next guest is Dr. Paul Alexander, president of Trinity Bible School. Paul will be joining us to talk about how to do a higher ed turnaround something that he excels at, having taken Trinity from an undeclared bankruptcy back to building a decent endowment, opening a graduate school, and adding new undergraduate programs. Whether you're a public, a private, or a Bible college, if you need or want to know about how to turn around an institution, be sure and join us. Changing Higher Ed is a production of The Change Leader, a consultancy committed to transforming higher ed institutions. Find more information about this topic, along with show notes on this episode at changinghighered.com. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe to the show. And we would also value your honest rating and review. Email any questions, comments, or recommendations for topics or guests to podcast at changinghighered.com. Changing Higher Ed is produced and hosted by Dr. Drum McNaughton, Post-production by David L. White.